This is Soraya from Where Did the Road Go? And Tim, congratulations on 100 episodes of Strange Familiars. Uh, Fun fact, that's two more than 98. I fully expect you'll hit 200 and go way beyond that. Uh, You have a great show, and I uh, absolutely love it. Hey, this is Adam. And this is Sergio. And we're from Conspiranormal podcast we love tim we love what he does he's been a frequent guest on the show and we want to congratulate tim and allison for a hundred episodes of strange familiars 100 episodes be on the lookout for flannel man bunny man slender man and all the tulpas and cryptos on strange familiars yep and here's the 100 more episodes tim thanks a lot for being there for us from Conspiranormal. Welcome to Strange Familiars. Hi. Episode 100. Woohoo! We time it right, and all of our redneck neighbors will have our celebrations ready in like 25 minutes from now. Oh, so they can hear the fireworks going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's always fun. As you can probably hear, I'm a little bit congested. I caught the Fay flu from Joshua Cutchin <laughs> when we were at Fort Fest, which was a lovely time. It was a, it was a great little festival. We spoke on Weird Bigfoot, and we heard a lot of cool other speakers. I had a great time. So thank you, Fort Fest, for having me and Josh. And at this point, I think like actually attending that is cheaper than buying 40 in Times anymore, right? <laughs> it, it, it might be. They are not connected 40 in times. I know, but we other, just other, than, other than by name only. Having to tap out when it got to be the, the price of a small independent book being published every month. Well, yeah, you can buy a book for the cost of 40 in times. It kind of makes it difficult to buy 40 in times. No, I do love 40 in times. I would take a gift subscription to that from 40 in times. Mm-hmm. Is if, it still being published? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I think if 40 in times wanted to. Sponsor. S- sponsor. Strange yeah. Familiars, yeah. That'd yeah. Be, that'd... I can't imagine a, a more specifically targeted right? group of people. We'd be the, the ideal. Yeah, it'd be great for them. Is this how people get sponsors? I don't know. <laughs> if... Also, like like maybe some hummus and um, some like an ice cream sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with 40 and Times would be a great sponsor for us. They should definitely look into that. Yeah, they should. <laughs> <laughs> so 100 episodes. That's pretty incredible. Thanks, everybody, for listening. There were times in the first 50 where I did not think we were going to make 100, so it's pretty neat to be there now. I have to say the second 50 were more fun for me than yeah. the first 50. I'm having more fun than ever doing it. I enjoy doing the show, even uh, even when I'm sick with Faye flu or whatever weaponized death Joshua gave me. <laughs> Hey, this is Tony Merkel from The Confessionals, and I want to congratulate the whole team at Strange Familiars for coming up on 100 episodes. That's no small feat, and you guys should be definitely proud of yourself, especially the fearless leader, Allison. Allison does such a great job from top bottom. She puts together the show in such an intelligently smart way. It's absolutely fantastic. And one of the smartest things she did was allow Timothy to help with the show behind the scenes. You guys do such a great job. Congratulations on 100 episodes.
This is Wes Germer with Sasquatch Chronicles congratulating Strange Familiars on hitting 100 episodes. It's definitely a milestone. Tim and Allison, you guys do a great job with the show. I love it. I listen every week. I love all the strange and odd topics that you guys come up with. Uh, you should be very proud of hitting 100 episodes. And I wish you nothing but success in the future. And congratulations on hitting 100 episodes. So is this the full circle moment when you reveal tonight's topic? Yeah, so it's been long requested that we do a powwow show. We touched on it a little bit way back in episode one. And we actually played, I think we played a clip of of this interview in episode one, if I remember correctly. Yeah, probably it was in reference to the Hex book itself. Yeah, I believe so, and, and the Hex murders. We're going to be playing an interview with one of the last powwow doctors in York County. Well, there are still some. But, but of a particular generation. Yeah, he was he's kind of the last of the old school ones, I guess, or one of the last of the old school ones. People who still spoke Pennsylvania Dutch with some regularity and... Before we get to that, I guess we should talk about like what is powwow a little bit. Yeah, for people who don't live in the land of Lebanon, Bologna. And... <laughs> <laughs> so powwow is a form of local folk magic and faith healing. It has been passed down from family member to family member for the most part. It is based in Christianity for the most part. There were some books out in the... 90s, I think, late uh -huh. 90s, which claimed it was a secret hidden pagan tradition. And uh, this has been well refuted. I believe the point. thing that the person had in common was being from our county. Yeah, <laughs> our general area anyway. Yeah. If you can hear a scrambling rabbit in the background, that is Echo. That's so funny. <laughs> so powwow was practiced openly in York County up until about the time of the Hex murder, when a lot of negative attention was placed on it. If you want to learn more about the Hex murder, you can check out episode one of Strange Familiars way back then. And then also there's an, a good documentary on it called Hex Hollow. It does a pretty good job of covering the story. Basically, a man named Nelson Raymire was murdered because some people thought he put a hex on them, which he did not. A lot of attention was focused on powwow and a, a lot of kind of shame mm -hmm. placed on the practice and on this area in general. It's kind of like, oh, look at those backwards. Dumb Dutchmen. Dumb Dutchmen. They still believe in Still believe in witchcraft. witchcraft. Yeah. But up until that point, there were uh, storefront powwow doctors you could go to in York. Mm -hmm. And people went to them to be healed. And these were the wise men. And they did everything from the laying on of hands to, like we said, faith healing with prayers to kind of sympathetic magic. There were a lot of charms and so forth they would tell, and, and you would take an egg and tie a string around it and put it in a furnace. You'll hear Philip Smith describe that. And Burying so potatoes and then another one. Yeah. Was that a cure for not having potatoes? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> You'll get more that way. Would you say, though, that that's indicative of that sort of subtle or not-so-subtle assimilation tactics that have been part of the American tradition? Shaming people, essentially. Shaming people for their for their beliefs that, yeah. that, that reside a little bit in their homeland or, oh, yeah. or in their own culture. Yeah. Yeah. So this came from Germany. Powell came from Germany. And we were talking about them. We don't know what they called it in Germany or if they called it anything other than just like a healing, healing or something. Yeah. You know, we, we don't know. But here they called it powwow. One of the explanations I heard was that they thought it looked a lot like what the Native Americans were doing. So when they saw these powwow doctors reciting these charms in German, and the the English speakers didn't know what they were doing, and they were there's, sometimes there's gesticulations, as they say, you uh -huh. know, movements of the hand, and of course if they're you know tying strings around eggs and so forth, to them it looked very exotic and what they called it, it looked like they were doing powwows. So that's one explanation I heard, like a Native American type stuff. So it became known as known as powwow for that reason, or or maybe some other. I'm I'm not sure. The main source for powwow is a book called The Long Lost Friend. That was published by a man named John George Homan in the 1800s. It's been in print ever since. And it's a collection of, like I said, spells and charms and prayers. And it's, it's very Christian-based. It was practiced 
for the most part outside of church, although I have heard some stories of, of local churches which allowed people to do powwow. Oh, really? Yes, oh. I, very recently. In fact, I heard there was a little church in, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but there was a little church in Leader Heights that before Blymeyer Curry and Hess went down to see Raymar, they did a little powwow ceremony there. Hmm. I'm not sure how true that is, but that's a little yeah, that's a little local lore I heard. It was mainly a Protestant tradition, which is very interesting because Homan was Catholic. They must not have known that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the long lost friend did make its way into Appalachia. I think generally in German speaking parts of Appalachia, because some people from this area did migrate to West Virginia. I think they probably took the long lost friend with them. But uh, I'm sure English versions have appeared in Appalachia as well. But mainly it is a Pennsylvania Dutch tradition. There are some who claim to be part of a secret powwow school or brotherhood or something. I don't know what to say about that other than that's not the way it was practiced around here to my knowledge. In York County, it seems to be a family tradition. It doesn't seem to be some kind of secret brotherhood. Wait, it's not like a fraternal organization. Or a mystery school or some kind of Crowleyan thing. At least I can find no evidence of that. So I don't know if that's a modern creation or if it's always been that way, but around here it doesn't seem to be much evidence of that. I would really doubt that the people that were practicing that would have a, a good sense of other, even contemporary at the time, magical traditions. Yeah, it, it's important to note that they thought Pow Wow, and for many of them, the long lost friend was... It like kind a conduit of, to God. It kind of sat next to the Bible, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and yeah, we were talking so much about how similar it is to Reiki in a way. Yeah, yeah, they could. Yeah, a lot of powwow people would, would practice from afar. Like you hear Reiki, like, people, yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. Hey, everybody! This is Tobias. This is Emily. And we're from the Singular Fortean Society, and we just wanted to congratulate Strange Familiars on 100 episodes. And here's to 100 more. This is Josh Riggs of the Country Road Legends podcast. I want to shoot a huge congratulations and shout out to Timothy Renner and his Strange Familiars podcast on their 100th episode, every lumberjack's favorite podcast. So who was this guy, John Homan, who wrote The Long Lost Friends? So there's been some other books on powwow written you can find if you look up powwow and so forth you can find other books written and i've heard that some people have gotten mad at people for revealing these secrets in these modern books well there comes a time where you can reveal secrets or you could save a cultural tradition that's about to have the last people who know about it fall away <laughs> <laughs> i wonder if people back in homan's time got mad at him for revealing the secret so because he was the first to publish you know what that almost seems like uh, like the the trope of the magician society right more yeah. so and that seems like a modern day thing yeah that's what i'm kind of getting at there have been a few people that have kind of poked at homan recently and kind of said like oh he just copied all that stuff from other books and he did if you look at egyptian secrets which was another book the powwowers used there's a lot that's the same between the two books. Isn't that how oral traditions are passed down? Like, yeah, and, and I bet if you found... eventually someone writes them down. <laughs> if you found an old enough book, probably Egyptian Secrets borrowed from that and so mm -hmm. forth, or you know, some other text maybe that wasn't published. Egyptian Secrets is accredited to Albertus Magnus. By the way, it was not written by Albertus Magnus. There's no evidence of that. The other book that some powwowers had was the Sixth and Seventh Books of Moses, which those were the, those were the bad ones, if you were. Those were the more witchy, hexy ones. Mm. If you were putting hexes on people, that's what you would need? Uh, not necessarily need, but that that was they were generally seen as like the darker books, you know? Like, like uh, your good powwow doctor, godly man, would have the long-lost friend, possibly Egyptian secrets. Mm -hmm. Your kind of more edgy, more dangerous guy might also have the 6th and 7th books of Moses along with that. So who was this George Homan? And we're going to read from... This is from the Pennsylvania Dutchman. 
from Thursday, August 18th, 1949. I have it on good authority that it, it is wonderful good. <laughs> the Pennsylvania Dutchman. <laughs> yep. Wonderful good. Good. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> John George Homan, man of many parts. John George Homan and his wife arrived in Philadelphia on the ship Tom from Hamburg on October 12th, 1802. His wife, Anna Catherine, was indentured to Samuel Newbold, a farmer who lived in Springfield Township, Burlington County, New Jersey. A week later, October 2nd, 1802, Homan bound himself as a servant to Adam Frankenfield, or Frankenfield, of Springfield Township, Bucks County. He was to serve for three years and six months and was to receive customary freedom, suits, and $20 in exchange for payment of his passage, which amounted to $84. Homan's name is first found in print in a broadside called Grodoria Himmelsbrief. This broadside was brought to America in 1802 and later published by Homan, probably in Easton. At this time, Homan was living near Hellertown, Northampton County. Homan's name next appears in the Adler account books on May 29, 1805. He is charged with the printing of 800 sheets of songs. It is impossible to ascertain at the present time the name and nature of these songs. They cost $9.50, but it was not until September 29th that Homan made a partial payment of $1 and a half. The Pennsylvania Dutchman is very concerned with these minute finances. <laughs> it's not shocking to <laughs> He still owes a nickel. <laughs> we next hear of Homan on another broadside, which is the story of the famous Meyerhoff murder. According to a note at the bottom of the sheet, it was published as a warning to those who are not inclined to follow the straight and narrow path. Homan says further that he changed certain words so that the ballad would be better adapted to singing. Besides, he has added three stanzas of his own, which never before appeared in print. It is signed, Johann George Homan, District Township, Berks County, January 8, 1811. This is the only time that Homan mentions District Township, and it may have been about this time that he attended the Church of the Holy Sacrament at Bally. On December 23, 1812, Homan bought for the first time two dozen Toff Shines, which were birth certificates. As far as we know, not a single tall shine signed by Homan has been found. So those were like fractors? Yeah, like a birth, almost like a birth fractor. So he would sign, like someone would have a kid and he would like fill them out or something for them? Yeah, Is he might have even made like ornamental ones that, yeah, that's what I'm, that he was uh, having printed out. Yeah. yeah. Stapleton, in one of his articles on German imprints, mentions the fact that Homan published a book about the wandering Jew. A book with a German title that basically is the book of the wandering Jew in German. It was published in 1813, according to an advertisement in the Reading Adler, April 27, 1813. No copy of this book is known to the writer. About May 10, 1815, Homan published a broadside containing three hymns, one a confirmation hymn for the Merch Church near Dryville, Berks County. That's where Jenny Bean lived. Dryville. That tiny little town, that's where Jenny Bean was from. I know. That was probably the church. Is that the church where she's buried? I don't know. This is the Mertz Church. It says it's near Dryville. I have to look that up. That might be where she's buried. <laughs> so that points back to our Broken Circle episodes, if you hadn't heard that. that's Yeah, a, this is not a big town. I think we went over that before. No. In the year 1818, Homan published The Land and House Apothecary. This was a general medical book for man and beast. There was also an appendix that discussed dying, with a special section devoted to the dying of hats. So, oh, that kind of dying. <laughs> dying uh, hats different than dying pants, I guess? Oh, I just, like, hearing it read, I, I assumed it was like a, uh, oh, like, a like, more of an existential thing. <laughs> <laughs> In the year 1819, Homan published two editions of the Evangelum Nicodemi. It must be remembered that this book had been printed as early as 1748 at Ephrata. So Ephrata was a little settlement. We should probably do a show on Ephrata. On the cloisters in Ephrata, yeah. yeah and really, the Wyoming missing and all like that. Really, really interesting. Uh, we'll do it either on this one or maybe that's for the Long Forgotten Friend. Our, our other podcast, which we will be starting soon, had some delays with me going off to uh, Rhode Island and then trying to get this book done and so forth. But we do have another podcast that we're working on. But we, We'll have to do something on, on Ephrata, on one podcast or the other. Holmes' editions were, however, more complete and contained much additional matter, including two books that were in the Lost Books of the Bible. During the same year, 1819, appeared Homan's Catholic Catechism. According to the best information that can be found, this book, like many of Homan's publication, was copied from other sources. Tradition says that it was printed for the Church of the Holy Sacrament at Bally. It should be noted again that plagiarism wasn't a thing back then. Copying other books was kind of the way things were done. 
Yeah, I think that idea of copyright is, you know, it, it didn't exist in early photography either. <laughs> right, yeah. In 1819 appeared the first edition of Hillman's famous Long Lost Friend. The book has been republished frequently up into our own day. That continues to be true, by the way. Holman published little of importance after 1820. In 1842 appeared a book with a very long German title. As the title implies, the songs, or rather hymns, were of a religious or spiritual nature, a call to repent, to repentance or conversion. The first one begins as follows. Ah, poor sinners that we are, help us, Lord, in our distress. All the hymns contain the same religious fervor, and all are signed by Homan. The hymns are followed by several ballads, among them The Poor Widow and The Sultan's Daughter. I'd love to get a copy of that book. Mm -hmm. Homan published his last book, as far as we know, in the year 1846. It had another long German title and was printed in Reading. The first part consists of Homan's version of another pseudo-epigraphical book of the Bible called The Childhood of Jesus. This book is supposed to have been written about 200 AD and was recognized by some early sects, including the Gnostics, as a genuine book of the Bible. In it, among other things, we find the story of the child Jesus making little birds of clay, putting them on a fence, and making them fly away. The latter part of the book consists of many of the songs which Homan had already published in broadside form. Although many of the songs are in the form of hymns, in one case only does Homan sign himself as the author. The rest of this article is taken up, for the most part, with what Homan paid in taxes in various years. <laughs> like said, they are concerned with the minutia of finance in the Pennsylvania Dutchman. But basically, they give uh, his various taxes, and some years he paid taxes, and some years he didn't, and so forth. Up until 1834, uh, where Homan, his name does not appear, but the name Casper Homan does appear on the tax records. He paid 26 cents at that time. 1835 and 1836, Homan appears again. I guess his taxes amounted to eight cents those years, so I don't know how he did that. <laughs> eight whole cents. He was allowed a deficiency to the full amount of his tax by the tax collector both years. I wonder if we're allowed a deficiency for the full amount of our taxes. <laughs> Do you just ask for that? I don't know. That? I don't know. This seems to indicate that Homan was at this time poverty-stricken. His name does not appear after 1836 in the Alsace Township tax list. In the year 1836, Homan published a broadside in which he stated he was living two miles north of Pricetown, near Fleetwood. From that time on, we know nothing about Homan. We do not know when he died or where he is buried. What they don't get to with all this, though, even if he was recopying all the stuff from other books, he had to be well read. Yeah, he was translating it. Yeah, I mean, this, he was, it's pretty interesting. Like, he had access to a large library, or he had a large library. He probably brought, I'm guessing, Egyptian secrets with him from Germany, and that's where a lot of Long Lost Friend comes from, but you know, that's just me guessing based on the, how much in common the two books have, and I believe Egyptian secrets predates Long Lost Friend by a good bit. I would be curious if we have any Swiss or German listeners, uh, you know, if they have a similar tradition that they would like to talk about. I yeah. would loved, I'd really love to hear about uh, Swiss-German culture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's original. There's a book called Trolldom, which is the expression of this a very similar folk magic tradition in the Nordic countries. It's an excellent book. I've tried to get the author to come on. I'll try again. But it's very interesting. There's some common stuff between the Long Lost Friend and that, but there's more than that. It's just the way things are done and the feeling of it is very similar. Mm -hmm. Like if you have the Long Lost Friend and you read the collection of, of charms and so forth that that guy put together in that book it just it, it feels like it comes from the same the same root source mm -hmm. very, very very interesting congratulations strange familiars on a hundred episodes from echo in here podcast Happy 100th episode from Al Reidenauer and Wilkinson of Bone and Sickle. So tonight we're, we're going to hear the Philip Smith interview. Before we hear that, we're going to talk to your mom, though, who interviewed Philip Smith in the 1970s. Anything we need to know going into your mom's interview? No, I don't think. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I think we cover most everything mm -hmm. in that. Let's go ahead and play that here. Yeah, so it was 
1979 is when you did this interview mm-hmm. uh, originally, and Philip Smith was again how old at that 75. time? 75. So he was 75 at that time. And how did you find Philip Smith? I had been talking to our elderly neighbors, and when I say elderly, they were probably at that time about my age now. They were probably <laughs> in their 70s, and they were telling us about people they knew in the area who either went to a powwower or who did powwowing, and they mentioned this guy who lived in our town. I had not been aware of him before that. Yeah, he lived not far. No. Lived not mm-hmm. far from where you are here, mm-hmm. just across the road and down a bit. The, the interview was done so you could write a paper for a college class. Right, about powwowing and whether or not it was still being done in the area, whether people had remembrances about it. And I went to a couple different places. I went to senior center in the area, I interviewed elderly rent relatives and friends, and then I did go to see this guy who actually did powwowing. Did you find a lot of remnants at the time? I did, in the elderly population. Younger people were dismissive of it, if they remembered it at all. But older people in the senior centers or relatives and friends who were in that age group were certainly familiar with it in this area. Did you find a lot of people still practicing, or were there just a scattered few? You know? I, the only one I was aware of at that time was this gentleman that I spoke to. Mm-hmm. And I think the only reason he agreed to speak to me was that I told him that my grandfather had been a powwower and that I was interested in learning more about it. And I think he may have inferred from that that I was interested in becoming a powwower. <laughs> it seems apparent, at, at, I think towards the end of the interview, where he, he mm-hmm. says, I thought you were here to, to learn this. Right, yeah. and I think that's really the only reason he agreed to speak with me. Now, your grandfather did do powwow. Mm-hmm. Did he call it powwow, or did he call it trying? When He he called it either. Either one. I heard him okay. use both terms. And he would powwow for us when we were kids. I remember my mother telling me that when I got my smallpox vaccination, which all kids need to be entered into school, that I became delirious with a high fever and he powwowed for me and that helped. Of course, I don't remember that. I do remember him powwowing for both my brother and me who had a tendency to have nosebleeds that would just spring up out of nowhere. And all she would do is call him on the phone and say, you know, so-and-so has a nosebleed and he would powwow from the other side of town. (laughs) I also remember a time when we went to an amusement park and I was stung by a wasp and my grandfather got some ice out of the ice chest and then started powwowing and that's the only time I remember him actually doing something. And I remember him tracing the area with his finger in a circular motion where I had been stung and saying something in German. And I asked him one time what it was and he said it's basically a prayer. Do you think it was all came from the long lost friend, or do you think he had other sources for? Well, his mother, my great grandmother, was a very interesting woman for her time, and I know my mother telling me that she read tea leaves, so I think she may have been the influence that would have been with him from the time he was a young child, because I can't imagine where else he would have learned it if he didn't learn it from her. Right. Well, that makes sense in that, and they said that it was passed from. Mm-hmm. One sex to the other, with right? It, with, to a family member, sometimes an aunt to a nephew. Mm-hmm. Et that, I mean, it makes sense that way. That's very, very interesting. So he could have had. There could have been some family cures or or charms or whatever. You know, that, absolutely. That were outside of the long lost friend, mm-hmm. possibly. Very interesting. And all of his uh, was in German when he whenever he yes, did it. when he did it, it was in German. I didn't understand it, and it was quite common for not just my grandfather, but other older people in this area to speak German when they were with mixed company, especially if they didn't want the kids to understand what they were saying, they'd speak in German or Pennsylvania Dutch, as they would call it. Yeah. My mother relates the story of doctors being scarce during World War II. And she told me the story of a young boy who was severely burned by a coal oil lamp in a neighboring town. And because they couldn't get a doctor, they called my grandfather. And she said he went to the house and powwowed for this young boy who apparently survived. And they knew about him in later years. And some time ago I asked her, she remembered his name and she didn't. But she said he went on to adulthood and was fine. And everybody was aware that the powwower had cured him. Wow. I remember my grandfather saying the same thing that Philip Smith related in the tape. That trying for someone, powwowing, was very draining for them 
And I remember my grandfather saying that he didn't like to do it unless he had to because it, it took so much out of him to do it. Yeah, that's mentioned a couple times, I think, in, in the Philip Smith interview. Mm-hmm. The paddling from afar, it, it has a... Uh, it's echoed today in people who do Reiki from afar, right? Yeah, it's virtually the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And you, you would have thought coming in, you know, coming out of the 60s and that in the 70s period, there would have been more interest in that. Mm -hmm. But do you think, I mean, there was a stain on it because right. of the <laughs> hex murder and so forth. Do you think that colored everything even through that point? I don't know. I sometimes like to look at this in historical terms because many of us have German ancestry and I know that when our German ancestors came to this area and their wills were in German, they learned to read and write in German, they didn't always assimilate well, but they were very anxious to rid themselves of the German heritage so that people would not look at them as being unwelcome. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing was true of some of the things that they knew, like the powwowing. I think they were afraid that it cast them in a bad light and so they were anxious to shed that although many of them relied heavily upon that because if they couldn't find a doctor or didn't trust a doctor they would try the powwow there is certainly a tone if you read the old newspaper articles mm -hmm. there is certainly a tone to the articles and if I'm not mistaken I think that's where the the insult which my father used to use whenever he got mad at someone with a Pennsylvania license tag mm -hmm. dumb Dutchman mm -hmm. I think it, it originates from that time, and mm -hmm. they basically said, oh, look at these people, they still believe in witchcraft. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have Groundhog Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, and getting back to the witchcraft aspect, my grandfather also was a believer in hexes, as was his mother, that you could put a hex on somebody. And my mother used to dismiss that, and she'd say, oh, there's nothing to that. That's just something people used to believe. But I think he was very much of the idea that you could somehow project ill will onto someone if they had wronged you in some way. Well, it's... It, it if seems very German. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I understand where that logic comes from and, and why people were often suspicious of powwow doctors because mm -hmm. the, the thought is, if you can do this to help people, maybe you can do it to hurt people too. Right. And, you know, so I kind of... I understand where that, mm -hmm. that notion comes from, I think. And I think if you're going to have that worldview that you know, this is possible, then the opposite may also be possible. Right. That's interesting, though, that your mother would call it when you had nosebleeds. Yes. But hexes were nonsense. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but she would call. Um, that, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting duality. Like at that yes. point where you're, I'll hang on to the good part, mm -hmm. but I'll just, that other stuff's nonsense. Right. And I remember a lot of superstitions that they had. I remember one time when I was probably about 10 or 12 years old, we went to a shopping center and as we were walking up onto the sidewalk, there was a, a pole of some kind there. And some of us worked on one side and some walked on the other side. And my grandfather said, no, you can't do that. You'll break your luck. But you can get around that if you say bread and butter. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I also remember my mother saying that they had all kinds of superstitions, like if a bird flew into your house, that meant someone was going to die. If a flower bloomed out of season, that meant someone was going to die. I mean, almost, the odds were in favor right, of that. <laughs> right. But almost always something bad was going to happen. It was an omen. It wasn't about the owls, too. Owls are bad, right? Yeah, she did not want owls in the house of any kind. My grandfather was very opposed to that. Not a picture of an owl, nothing. Hmm. Which is weird because I have a set of cups with a picture that belonged to my grandmother, and they have owls on them. Now, now I don't know if that's a... Uh, if it's... Only well, there's a lot of cultures have owl things, mm -hmm. but in Germany, it supposedly I've read that it comes from this Frau Perkta, who was this very uh, this kind of mountain goddess. But her animal, her sacred animal, was the owl, and she was she was not a nice entity a lot of times, and supposedly it comes from that. But I always found it interesting when we moved into Glen Rock. I don't know if you remember when we first toured our house there, how mm -hmm. many owls mm -hmm. there were all over that house. Yes. And always. But a lot of people collect owls around here yes, too. Yes, they though. do. The, yeah. There were, but there were owls everywhere, like little statues. I mean, mm -hmm. not, you know, not actual owls. The other th question I want to: Would you consider your grandfather and your great grandmother to be religious people? That's a good question because I've asked myself that many times. My grandfather 
and my grandmother were very active in the church community. And I remember them being the influence upon me to go to Sunday school because my grandmother insisted if I stayed overnight at her house, I had to say my bedtime prayers. She was very religious. However, I don't think my grandfather necessarily bought into that. It was more of a social thing for him and he did it because of my grandmother's interest in the church. His mother, I don't think was very religious either. I think it was a thing with people at that time where it was there any connection with a social group. And I don't know how you would reconcile that with <laughs> the kinds of things they believed in as far as the witchcraft and the hexing and so forth. But they didn't think it came from like a, something secular from it. Like the, the powwowing wasn't like a witchcraft kind of thing. They, they wouldn't have perceived it that way. No, I don't think they did perceive it that way. They looked at it as a healing art, but they also had that side with the hexing <laughs> and the witchcraft and the superstition. So it's hard to say. Do you remember when you were young, more people talking about it in general? Or you know, was it more of a hush-hush? I thing? honestly don't believe that I remember anybody talking about it except within my family because we were pretty guarded growing up and we were kept quiet about a lot of things with our family. And I think it was kind of a thing where we really shouldn't be overt about it. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really talk to people about it until I was older and then I expressed more interest in it. My mother would share some information with me and my grandfather never really wanted to talk very much about it because I asked him about it on a few occasions and he didn't really want to mention anything about it. And I think he also had that fear that people would look upon him in a, a different light. Was he deceased by the time you had done the... the yes, years? he was. And I do remember my mother saying that there were several neighbors who would come to him for powwowing. I mean, anybody who knew him on a personal level would not hesitate to ask him to powwow for them, but it wasn't as though it was a public thing, except with the story my mother related about during the war. Maybe people were aware that he was able to do this and they were willing to try anything they could. Yeah. What was the other question? Yeah, I'm not sure. At the end of the, I asked her about the end of the interview, he says he's giving her something, but... Yeah, I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know I if they that. were... Because he said he had... Some of the stuff was definitely from Lone Lost Friend that he was saying. Mm -hmm. There was others he said that certain people had taught him things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd be, I'd be really interested oh, to well, know if I'd, any of his papers went to his children or anything. If they yeah, I don't know. You know. I don't know what happened. I do remember when he related the story about the dinner plate with the Sator Opera Tenet. Mm -hmm. I had heard someone else tell me that before, and I think there was a connection with my grandfather in regard to those words, but I can't remember anything specific, but it rang a bell with me when he talked about it. And I do remember my grandfather saying that powwowing was used for two things, basically, to take out fire and to stop bleeding. And I thought, wow, you know, if, if you have to rely upon some rudimentary form of healing, those are the two major things you need to be concerned about. Yeah, sure. It's a really, really interesting tradition. It's amazing that Homan, he must have had, if you look at Egyptian Secrets, which I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember, but in Mr. Smith must have handed you that as well when you were there because he said, this is Egyptian Secret by oh, Albertus okay. Magnus, which is, it's not really by Albertus Magnus, but that's the <clears> name on it. You know, a lot of Long Lost Friend come from that. Homan either had a copy of that or he had extensive notes because a, a lot of it's it's very similar. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he came here and then published that, I, I think it could only happen in Pennsylvania in that mm -hmm. sense because of the freedom of religion and because of what was happening here culturally, I think. Right. Even the printers, even yeah. to have the, enough... Yeah independent people to print those broadsheets right. and those. And there was a, you know, a German language newspaper for a long time here. There was a huge mm -hmm. population of German people and they knew that they would be receptive to that. So it probably was something that would have, as you said, not as been as well received in other areas, but here it was. Yeah, now the, the and the long list print did make its way through to certain parts of Appalachia, but it tends to be places that were German speaking, mm -hmm. not necessarily English, but it's I mean it's certainly huge here and it's still in print. It's been in print since it was originally published. I guess it's more. I guess it's more common now. I mean, they have it at the historical society and stuff. Yeah, and there's a lot of editions online because it's not. It's in public domain. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just from the standpoint of cross culturally, I remember having a professor in college who was from India, and she talked about the fact that her family and other people 
relied very heavily upon cures that they could get from a certain tree or a certain mm -hmm. prayer. And she said she specifically remembered one that was just for toothaches. Ah. And I thought, you know, this, it's very common. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very common. Yeah. I mean, the English, they just called him the cunning man. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wouldn't be your powwow pow doctor. They called mm -hmm. him the cunning man. Same thing. You know, mm -hmm. the same. I would think most powwowers would consider themselves to be Christian. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, the language in the book is there's no secret coding about it. It's, it's, they're very much, you know, prayers yeah. and so forth. Homan was Catholic, which was odd in itself. That mm -hmm. this because this became very much a Protestant tradition. Mm -hmm. This did not become a, a, a Catholic tradition. There are, as someone who grew up Catholic, when I read it, I see the Catholicism in there. I see the mm -hmm. nods to Mary and the and the saints and so forth. But the fact that it really took hold amongst the Protestants is very interesting to me. That well, it's still German. <laughs> <laughs> is German Catholics close enough? German Catholics close. German trumps other religions. Oh, okay. <laughs> So you didn't grow up super religious, right? No, I did not. <laughs> and again, and that, like your mother would call to have powwowing mm -hmm. done. It's amazing. That's that's an amazing thing. Like, well, I think she looked at it as some special gift that my grandfather had that she could call upon if she needed it to protect her children. Mm -hmm. Because I don't remember her ever calling him and saying that he should powwow for her. Yeah. It was just for her children. No, that's very interesting, though. That's very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. So to say your mom was the easiest person to edit that we've ever had on the podcast. That's not shocking to me. Very impressive. She should be hosting the show, not me. Seems like the, the most reasonable <laughs> choice. <laughs> She's welcome back on any time. She's very well composed. She did not know what we were going to be asking her. Yeah, she didn't know the questions ahead of time. I don't think we knew the questions no, ahead of time, either. really. I just kind of rolled with it. But, wow, I was, I was super impressed. For those of you who read my books, she's also edited three of my books. So you come from good stock there. Yeah, I chose it that way. I married well. This is Lon Strickler from Phantoms and Monsters and Arcane Radio. Congratulations to Timothy Renner and Strange Familiars for the 100th episode. This is Tobe Johnson from Strange Brow Radio. Happy 100th episode to the folks, the Strange Familiars. And Timothy Renner, you make it look so easy. Awesome work. We'll see you in the trees. So, some things we should say about Philip Smith before going in. There is that York County, Pennsylvania Dutch accent he has pretty thick. Mm -hmm. Give it time. I think the more you hear it, the interview, I think it'll become clear. It's, he's a little hard to understand, I think, mm -hmm. at first, but I think the more you listen, like you, you kind of pick up what he's saying. Not as thick as the, the those, plumbers that used plumbers to come. We, had here. <laughs> we needed a translator. I had to have Allison's father. They were speaking English, <laughs> but the York County slash Pennsylvania Dutch accent was so thick, I honestly couldn't understand him. I needed your father to translate what he was saying. <laughs> And your dad, it was very natural. You're, they're like cracking jokes and your dad's laughing. I'm like, he understood that? I remember looking at you just being like, what is he saying? So Philip Smith isn't that bad. But uh, I think if you're not used it's, to it, it... Some of it is just that he's like an elderly man, too, that it's a little bit... Yeah. Different. He hits the table a lot during the interview. You can hear him for uh, emphasis. <laughs> yeah. So you'll hear him hit the table a lot. When he talks about trying, I think we went over that with your mom a little bit. Trying is kind of interchangeable with powwowing. When he says, I tried for someone, or I am, I said I'd try for him, or I, et cetera. Any form of trying also means powwowing. That means he, he would try to powwow for them. Do more than eat butter bread. My absolute favorite Pennsylvania <laughs> Dutch saying. From context, he uses it, and I've, I've seen it in other newspaper articles about powwow and stuff. They use it as, as kind of saying someone had a, a talent more than just doing earthly things, I think, so... 
It was, oh, that was to say they had like a natural affinity for it. Yeah, you know, it was like they could actually do powwow. They could do more neat butter bread. So the phrase was used other ways as well, but like I think powwow doctors used it specifically in that way, which is neat. Some point out of nowhere, he just starts saying S A T O R S A T O R. He's saying the Seder Square, which is a magic square. Um, I'm not sure if people have seen it. Seder Opera Tenant. Yeah. It's like backwards, forwards, diagonal. You get. Yeah, the same I'll words. try to print the Seder Square in the show notes, but that's just. It's in the Long Lost Friend. It's one of the charms they use. In fact, it's when he tells the story about the plate that somebody puts in the fire and puts it out. I believe it's the Seder Square you write on the plate and then put it on the, in the fire. And for those of you who are familiar with Stone Breath, you will notice that I use samples from this interview all over the first Stone Breath record. <laughs> so that's way back in 1996 or 7, I think. And, uh, of course, the first Stone Breath record, the 7-inch record, not the first album, the first record was called Strange Familiars. It was such so, a good name, you couldn't... No, I had to reclaim it. There were a couple of bands that started using it after that and when I started the podcast. It makes more sense in this context than it did even in any of those other contexts, I think. Well, it's, it's always a name I wanted to use again. And I thought, you know what? You know, I don't know if they came up with that name on their own or not. Mm. But the fact remains that I did use it first on that record. I thought, I don't want to give it up. Yeah. I want to use it again. So when I started the podcast, I said, you know what? I'm going to call it Strange Familiars. So, uh, yeah, so let's hear Philip Smith. He's the guy that opens the show, every single show. Yeah, and do you want to do like a quick translation of what he's saying in the, the beginning of each show? Yeah, basically, and I might have a couple words off here, but basically he's saying, they say if our eyes were created a slight different from what they are, when we talk, you'd see flames of fire shooting out of our mouth. Yeah, and you want to talk about where you think that that might have shown up? Yeah. So there's a movie called Apprentice to Murder. Donald Sutherland is in it. It's loosely based on the Ray Meyer hex murder. From the mid-80s? Yes. And in it, there's very little kind of like Harry Potter style, like laser beam magic, Mm -hmm. you know? I think there's a rabid dog at one point that, that somebody stops with powwow with something written on a paper, maybe. Uh-huh. But there's no, like, you know, laser beams and wands and stuff like that. Did you not have your piece of paper with you when you were in the same exact hollow and that rabid raccoon came after you? <laughs> <laughs> you should have just thrown some a magic square at him. I'm well, sure he would have gone away. My staff is covered with uh, protection symbols, including from the long lost friend. So maybe, maybe it worked. Yeah, that's true. He didn't get to me. That's true. But in any case, at, at some point in the movie, they're about to murder the stand-in for Raymar, essentially. And he opens his mouth and breathes fire. And it's the only time there's this, like, outward expression of, like I said, like, kind of your Harry Potter-style magic. Oh, the, the Nelson Raymar character breathes yeah. fire. Ah. Yeah. And I often have wondered if, when they were doing research for that film, if they didn't come to York County and... Hear the tape. Hear your mom's tape. Hear her interview. And it's such a good line. If we, if ours were created a slight different, you'd see flames of fire coming out of our mouth. I mean, visually, that's an amazing line. And I often wonder if they went, well, that, yeah, let's, let's incorporate mm-hmm. that in the movie. I don't know, but it'd be cool if that was the case. And I believe if you look up Apprentice to Murder on YouTube, mm-hmm. the trailer's there. And I think that scene is in the trailer. Mm-hmm. So I think you could it's see. It's not a great movie. And no, it's, it's not it's, really it's, representative on any level of what happened there. No, it is not a great movie. But it is a movie. It is that. Let's hear Philip Smith. Well, that's okay. I'm, you know, I'm interested in preserving this because I know nobody talks about it anymore, and I want my kids to know what it was about because my grandfather powwowed, and I think it's something that people in the family should know. My grandfather's name was Schindler. Good German name. Schindler. Yeah, good German name. And he was the one in our family who powwowed. But why, you know, no one in the second generation went on with it, I don't know. See, my mother tells me about it. It was her father. But he was very secretive about it. He never told me very much about his powwowing. And so no one, you know, I wish somebody could have helped. Well, yeah. times I'm just kept busy. I can imagine. And it's not. Uh, but what some people think, some of these things you try for, it, it hits you too. Mm-hmm. You, you feel it. Well, that's what my grandfather used to claim. He got very Especially Ill. taken off. Mm-hmm. Rickets. The doctors call it rickets. Yeah. Well, I know my husband's brother had rickets as a baby, and they had him around a couple places to powwow. 
I think they said they took them to Mrs. Ritz. Was that her name? Yeah, Jenny Ritz. Yeah. That's yes. where I got this one that I wrote off for. Oh. There. That's both of them. Uh, this oh, here this here is to stop the blood, and that is also to stop the blood. But simply by just uh, saying, I hear, the Lord see a stop, and there shall stop all flow of blood, instead of all flow of blood, all heart trouble. Ah. You can try for heart trouble. Ah. Just by knitting that and say, all heart trouble. Now, when you say it, though, do you say it in Pennsylvania Dutch? No, not no, this. You don't. Oh, you no, don't. This, here is, this here isn't. But I got one for convulsions. I wrote that off for, I don't know if you know Chance Ritz or not. No, I don't. Uh, oh, Jenny Ritz's son. Oh, was it was for. Well, uh, now this I got in Dutch. Ich wann ihr reist und am Gister, da steht einer im Gericht, der spricht Gericht und im Gericht. Und wo der reist und am Gister. Now that's in Dutch. Yeah. Now I translate it for Chance Rich's girlfriend. Ah. And she said that it worked wonderful. Good. Uh, for Ricketts are taken off. Three false tongues have bound thee. Three holy tongues will call thee back. And, of course, now them ends, they stand for the name of the person. Mm -hmm. You keep their name, and you do it three times before you say amen. Yeah. Well, now, my grandfather used to power off me. I used to get nosebleeds all the time when I was a kid. And I know I asked him one time what he was saying, and he said it was, all I can remember was he'd say, Paradise now this is Christians taken out of the still. Bible, the thirteenth chapter of Saint Matthew. And the sixth, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth yeah, thirteenth verse. Mm -hmm. In Saint Matthew. But if you read Saint Matthew, uh, yeah, thirteenth mm -hmm. chapter. If you read Saint Ma Saint Matthew you declare, don't say nothing about stopping blood. But them words are all in that chapter, in, and in, in them four verses. That's where the words come out from, and they're put together as a prayer. And Jenny Rich told Amos Herman, he was the district attorney at the time. You re you should remember something about the Weimar, Raymar case. From the oh, I, I read about it, yeah. Well, the district attorney, after that case was uh, going or uh, settled, he come out one day to old Jenny Ritz. Big Cadillac. Stopped outside, he went up and wrapped the door, she left him in. He says to her, he says, uh, do you have any books? She says, books? He says, this is my book. He says, take it from me. He says, I guess you don't know who I am. She says, I don't care who you are. She says, he says, he's a district attorney, Amos Herman. Mm -hmm. Here he was chicken out on her. He was trying to get her in trouble. Oh, she walks over to him and looks out and seeing the big Cadillac sitting out there. She says, Mr. Uh, Herman. Herman, yeah. Mr. Herman, is that your guy sitting out there? He says, yes. He says, that's my car. Well, she says, suppose you'd have been coming down the road here. She knew what he was after. He was after to get her in trouble. Mm -hmm. Suppose you'd have been coming down the road here and he says, you'd have had an accident, got an arm tore off or a leg tore off or cut otherwise an mm -hmm. artery and you'd be bleeding to death. She says, would you appreciate it if I'd have stopped your blood and seen that they got you to the hospital to take care of you? He says, could you do something like that? She says, I just can't do it. She says, I did it hundreds of times. And she says, it never failed on me. Well, he quieted down. He told, she, he, she told him, she says, this is my book. Take it from me. 
There must have been a lot of people who got kind of upset about the Hex trial. Oh, I got that that was no Hex trial. As quick as I read in the newspaper that the, this uh, Limeyer and this Curry boy, and of course the Hess boy, took him down in his car. He was <laughs> drunk into it. As quick as I read in the paper that they went, uh, he was supposed to be the witch doctor, and he went down there to get a tuft of his hair mm -hmm. to punish him. And in the scuffle, they took a chair and they killed the man. Well, as quick as I seen that they, he had to go down in, in something like that there, you don't have to know who the witch is even. You can, sh you can fire on them if, if you take that part up. I don't take too much of that up because it's a risky business. Can imagine. And uh, if uh, it happens you get a hold of a gang of them and they're smarter than you, boy, they can nail you the dermis. I can imagine. So, uh, then the paper come out and said they found his hex book, The Long Lost Friend. Ah. Well, I happen to know what The Long Lost Friend is. And right there, then I know it was no hex or I at all. It was a plain robbery. Mm -hmm. Well, my wife, she attended uh, the uh, court session still. Oh. She used to take off. She worked in there at the cigar factory. Mm -hmm. and, and them girls took off when they hear this case. That was interesting. Yeah. And uh, she says it wasn't fought as a witch uh, case. It was the the they argued about the robbery. They went down to rob him and kill him. Hmm. Didn't turn out like they thought it would. No, it didn't turn out. But boy, they had honest right, right up to bottom. Yeah, I can imagine it gave powwowing a bad name, huh? Didn't deserve. Yeah. Well, how did you get started in powwowing? Did one of your parents do it? My dad tried for stomach fever and taken off. That's about all he did. He was afraid to read the books. And uh, what started me off, now you can't buy a small book like this. That's a long lost friend. Oh, I've heard of that, but I've never seen a copy of it. You can buy the book yet. You can buy this. You just need secrets, too. Albertus Magnus. It's called the Egyptian Secrets. Hmm. You can still get this, both of them. But now, this is. See, I can stick it in my shirt. Yeah. Part. That's an old one. I know that since 1915, hmm. and that was my grandmother's. And what started me off that I got interested in learning to do this which I didn't get into it for years. Occasionally, if I run across somebody, I know that I know it's something to do for them. I said, why, I, if you believe, I'll, I'll try for you. Mm -hmm. Well, when Jenny Ritz passed away, that's when I really got into it. Mm. When now, did she die? I don't remember anymore. It's good many years ago. I would think. Yeah, it's... I'll say about 18, 20 years that uh, she passed away. Well, when she passed away, the people started hunting me out. Are there very many people around who still powwow? Or you want to no, I don't know anybody. I don't either, because I've been trying, you know, to find a... I, I figure don't people know of anybody. anybody. Now, Lou McClure, she used to down on Indian Rock Dam Road. Mm. Uh, but, uh, well, I guess she put herself out of business. She got me to take her into uh, York Hospital and Ralph Hess. Uh, the senator? Senator Hess, yeah. He had his hip or leg, something or not, I forget, he had an accident. Anyway, he was in the hospital. And here one day she called me on the phone and asked me if, she, if I'd take her into the hospital to try for, for Senator Hess. Well, I thought she knew this man. I thought probably yeah. he's one of uh, he would have her patients. Yeah. I said, yeah, I'll run in. Well, I, went, well, I wasn't even dressed to go in the hospital. 
Went down, picked her up, and on the way in, I said, what for looking man is this Ralph Hiss? Yeah, I don't know. She says, i never seen him. I thought, boy, I said, you go to the York Hospital to try for that man. Why not me? I says, I ain't going in the hospital. I says, I ain't dressed for it. Oh, she says, I don't know my way around the hospital. She was Don't in good shape to go in, huh? Yeah, she just wanted to, you know, stick her nose out. Yeah. She didn't realize what she was going against, yeah. bucking against. Well, I went along up with her, and uh, she told me the room number. She had his room number, got it out of the paper. But I thought she knew the man. Well, I went along, and I said, well, that's on the South Wing elevator. we got to go up South Wing. Having elevator, we went up to the, he was the fifth floor he was on. I forget just what his number was, but anyway, when we got off of the elevator, the numbers were right in front of you, but it didn't run up as high a number as what his room number was. And I wasn't acquainted in the back end there. You know, the, the nurses uh, got their office mm -hmm. in the back of the, go through the door and right yeah. Next is where the nurses are, then the hall goes over here and goes out this way, and the numbers keep continuing. Mm -hmm. But we looked, I says, well, the numbers don't run that high. It must be over here somewhere. <laughs> when we started out <laughs> going that way, we got smaller numbers. And I says, no, you're wrong. We turn around and come back, and just as we turn around and come back up towards the corner, some young man come walking around the corner. And Lou stopped him. She says, could you tell us where Senator Hess's room is? He looked, he says, uh, are you a relative of Hess? No, she says, we just come to see him. Well, I said, just go around the corner there and keep going out through there, out in that aisle there. So we went, opened the door, and here was their office part. Hall went over, went out past the office, kept on going. I looked up there, here I seen the number. I says, Lou, come on, here it is. She walked over the desk, she wanted to inquire there. I seen, I seen the number, and went up and the door was partly open. Lou went and looked in the door and Hess was sitting on his bed and had his papers, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, they were just doing, he had a bunch of papers, his office work. And uh, he says, come in. So she went in, I thought. And had a chair in front of me, all a bunch of papers and stuff laying on. Yeah. And the car went around the bed on the other side, and of course. He laid over. And she told him right away what you come for. Come to try for his leg. Hmm. And what did he say? He, he, Boy, <laughs> she started. And in the meantime, Hess says to me, he says, move that stuff over on that dresser. She says, uh, sit down there. I said, never mind. I says, I don't mind standing. No, move it over there. By God, he rolled over and he got it and he laid it over himself. He said, sit down. I never told him that I tried for people. <laughs> well, I got a couple of weeks, he wasn't more than out of the hospital, a week or two, by golly, she got a notice. Really? And uh, she told me, she says, watch yourself there after you and me both. Oh, my. Well, now, how do they know that, uh, how did he that know? I was he... doing this? Yeah. But uh, nobody ever followed me outside of, well, I guess about a year ago, some uh, woman come here and she wanted, oh, she asked all kinds of questions. I didn't give her much satisfaction. You have uh, to be careful, she, huh? She, you had to be careful what you talk to them. Yeah. Uh, I ain't going to get in on nothing. Well, yeah. they can't get nothing on me because I don't charge. Yeah. I know that my grandfather always said you can't charge for powwow. He said that you don't do that. So. Uh, some of them did not at Urban Navy in uh, York, we stayed going to and on, uh, on, you know, in uh, Huff. No, Princess Street. Yeah, Princess Street. 
close to the Solar Works uh, here, did And uh, he really didn't charge, but boy, he bought uh, all you out if uh, uh. I had my brother-in-law, Harry Harding, in there oh, some years ago. And boy, the way he talked, why my brother-in-law was just lucky it got in there. His heart was that bad, he could have fell uh. over any minute. <laughs> <laughs> with nothing to it. And it was a party in before we uh, we got in. We were sitting in his front room waiting. And uh, boy, we didn't more than get in his back in his office where he flashed for him. And uh, he started in moaning about this couple that just went out. He says, they let me out of 50 cents down. He says, here they run to the doctors and pay six, eight, ten dollars. And he says, get some medicine. And he says, it don't help him a bit. And he allows it 50 cents. Well, I, I, once in a while, I don't get too many, but once in a while I get uh, people that, well, the they're poor, they can't. And I don't charge in the first mm -hmm. place. Well, I don't say a word about it. Yeah. But they're so grateful but, to you. But other ones, I think they give more than they, they should. I think I'd put in a year, in a year's time. What I do, don't charge anybody. What do most people come to you for? What problems? Oh, a little bit, boy. They, you'd be surprised what people come for. That the dumb, dumbest, dumbest stuff they come for and ask you. They think you, if you help different cases, and you know you, you can help them. That is, I always tell them, I says, it's not me that does it. I says, you read your Bible and the Bible tells you when Jesus healed something, he says, not I do the works, the Father within me, he doeth the works. Mm -hmm. Now you know who the Father within you is. The breath of life, the spirit. You've got a body within your body, your spirit body. Your physical brain tells you one thing, but that spiritual body tells you the, the, the real things. You'd be surprised how many years ago I was standing there and Mike Kirshner, I don't know if you knew Mike Kirshner or not, uh, his son Wilbur was the caretaker down here at the York Water Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he come here one winter, he, he had poor, poor blood circulation. And it froze them two fingers. Oh, no. And he started to treat them himself for, oh, a week, two weeks or so. Anyway, anyway, they started to turn them black as a hat and started to smell. Mm. So Wilbur come in the house one day. He says, Dad, he says, you get out here in the truck. He says, I'll take you up here to Doc Gitz. That time Dr. Gitz was up here in town. Oh. And he said, I'll take you up to Doc Gitz. Boy, when he got in up there and gets seen it, he said, oh, my God, Mike, he says, we got to take them fingers off. He says, no, you ain't going to cut my fingers off. Well, he says, I miss my guess if we don't cut them off. He says, you know what you got? You got gangrene. Well, he put some stuff on, whatever it was, and had them all bandaged up. And, of course, rubber had cut couple of his men working down at the lower end of the press, and uh, Mike wanted to stop it. This is Mary Ness Sucker. She died, too, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, that was his sister. So he dropped uh, him off with Mary, and he stayed there till in the evening when uh, they went home, picked him up, and took him along down. Well, he didn't more get to talk to Mary, and she found out what it was. She got on the phone and called me. She says, Mike's coming down to you. He's got gangrene in two of his fingers. Oh, Mary, I says, I don't know what to do for gangrene. I never, never learned anything for gangrene. Well, he's coming down to see you. And boy, I walked out here in the kitchen, and that time I didn't have that porch enclosed. By that time he was there at the door. I left him in, he come in, had his fingers all wrapped up. He says, Doc Gitz wants to cut my fingers off. He says, he says, I got gangrene. I want you to try for it. 
Mike, I says, I just told your sister over the phone. I says, I know what you're talking about, but I says, I never remember anything for that. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. And boy, he danced. I guess he Jumped was around. very he just desperate. Was, he, he was just so desperate. He mm -hmm. thought, and boy, did that hurt me. I, I thought, what in the world can I do? And I just stood there and thought. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice. Told me what to speak. And it wouldn't have been for Aunt Ida. She got a, a piece to try to blow fire. Oh. And you burn yourself and scald yourself. Mm -hmm. Get the fire out. And that's the way she got it. From the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And if it wouldn't have been for that, I don't think I'd have took any heed to it. Australia. I says, Mike, give me them hands, that, them fingers. He handed them out like that, and I got a hold of them. I spoke it three times. I says, this evening before Wilbur comes up, I says, you come down here, I want to try it for you again. And I says, tomorrow morning. All right, he uh, come down before his son come and picked him up. Tried two times that day, morning and the evening. Next morning, I tried again. Following day, he was supposed to come back to Doc Getz, see what his mm -hmm. medicine done with him, bandage it on there. Mike said he took them bandage off. Well, now, Mike, you said maybe after all, well, I can save your fingers. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Mike told me, oh, he told me many times, he says, Doc Getz took the credit for it, but he says mm -hmm. it wasn't Doc Getz, yeah. you darn. And boy, he lived for, oh, I'll say, at least 10 years over in Dallas Town with his daughter. And uh, you couldn't tell that the fingers were ever black or ever had any Never had any trouble with them, huh? Never had a bit of trouble. It's remarkable. And I got people come here with sores on their legs that big around. In fact, I have one woman from over at... Uh, S.K. Harding was my brother-in-law of the orchard. Do you know where Harding is? Yeah, I know where the orchard is. Well, that was my brother-in-law. Well, um, Dorothy uh, Rupert. She was uh, one of the Bear girls. Mm -hmm. This Root and Bear, you know, that uh, delivers oil. Oh, I've heard of uh, that. It's her, his sister. Oh. Well, man, I'm telling you, her legs are, oh, boy, they're that big. And she come over here twice already now, in the last two years, uh, and she don't care to take care of herself, um, and she's diabetic. Yeah, that's And uh, boy, she come over here twice already. Her leg it looked terrible. Now it wasn't open, but it like a good start for gangrene. Yeah. And I tried that, and every time hmm. she comes around all right. Good. Why do you think it is that some people are better at powwowing than others? I mean, why are you so successful? I don't think they believe. Is that what it is? They just don't believe? Uh, or no, I, I forgot to tell you when I started out. I was hired over with my uncle on the farm, my uncle and my grandparents, grandpa and grandmother, and of course this is grandma's, this was grandma's book. And my Aunt Maisie, when she passed away, and Grandma passed away. Aunt Maisie says, I'll see you with that book. And I mm -hmm. got it ever since. And that's written by John George Holman from Lancaster County. He's mm -hmm. a very big Christian man. I've heard of that book before. And he, he defies anybody to misuse that book in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Or don't believe in it, he says. You'll be punished for your belief. And he says, if you, things in that book you can help people, you're guilty of a person's death. If, if you know what to do and you don't do it, and you don't. You don't believe. Mm -hmm. So, what got me started then, I was over there on the farm. And that was in 1918, during World War, when the, mm -hmm. around the time of the World War. World War I. Mm -hmm. Well, I and Bill Saddle, the florist over here at Squire, maybe you 
her build mm -hmm. a saddle of flowers on Cherry Street. Mm -hmm. Well, him and I grew up together. I'm older than he is, but uh, we grew up together. So Uncle Bob, he sent me down to Benroy at the Strickler's machine shop to get a casting that he had done there. That is my younger uncle, which later in later years we both married sisters. He was my uncle brother-in-law, and my wife's sister was my aunt and sister-in-law. <laughs> so Uncle Bob, uh, he uh, didn't go on too. He sent us down there with a horse and an open spring wagon to get this casking up. Well, that time I was smoking a smoke pipe. Going up through the woods, I lit this pipe up, and I just threw my match out. Didn't even blow it, I just threw it out. And when we come back up, we seen the smoke coming up through the trees mm -hmm. up in Chestnut Hill. I said to Sybil, I said, Bill, I said, some darn old tramps up there cooking dinner. I thought him when we come up here, the woods was on fire. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa, he had a cork leg, and uh, he could get along good if he had a rake or a hoe or something in his hand. He'd hang his two canes and in his heavy suspenders that helped this leg on. Mm -hmm. And boy, he could walk along pretty good. Well, if he'd sit down, you didn't know he had a wooden leg. Mm -hmm. He had a cork leg. Well, we come up there, he hollered at us, get home quick and grab rakes and come and help to break the leaves back. He says, don't take the harness off the horse, run him in the stable and shut the door and let him in there, and grab rakes and come up here. Well, we did, and we went up there and we helped him to rake, we raked the leaves spot six feet, there off of the ground, figuring, figuring the fire when it come up there, it couldn't go no mm -hmm. far. Well, like fun, come up there, uh, just a little shower of wind, picked the leaf mm -hmm. up and Blowed it right over on our pile of leaves. Mm. After a bit, I see my grandma coming running up the old market road. Had a dinner plate in her hand. Well, I know that I ate over that plate oh, many a time. I thought, now, what does Grammy want with that dinner plate? <laughs> she come up. Well, the fire had burned it. We couldn't even see the end of it. That's how far it spread oh, yeah. around. I'll say it four or five acres it had covered, and we wanted to hit it off and don't get back over the highway and get down to Spring Woods. Mm -hmm. Boy, it'd be hundreds of acres back there of burned. Yeah. But we couldn't stop it. Your grandma come running up there, had a dinner plate in her hand, and the fire had burned, oh, 75, 80 feet away already, or everything off of the ground. But a double chestnut tree stump was there, and leaves blew in there, and that stump was burning like everything. She walked up there and stuck her plate in, and stood back there, and <laughs> just looked at her. I thought, what's Granny doing that for? I quit raking. I thought, no, news. We rake, we can't. The fire was coming towards us. It didn't travel fast, but it, it ate its way mm -hmm. towards us. What did she do that for? After a bit, I seen in front of us this flame. It, you could just see it dwindling down, and as far as you could see it in that circle, the flame just kept coming down and down. And oh, after a bit, the flame was gone, and the darn circle smoked. Where she had her plate in the stump, that was still flaring up. But when this flame started to go down here, and this smoke, I seen the flame going down in the stump, down in the stump, and. Smoke. Smoke everywhere. Just smothered out. Amazing. Granny, Granny went home. <laughs> Forgot about it. She done more in five minutes than we done all oh, our work with you. How old were you then? I was uh, 18. I was 14. I bet you were just amazed when she did that. Why, I was. And, uh, and I, I seen... Her and an old Irishman that was there, oh, he was so nervous, he used to carry wood in for Grammy and Aunt Maisie. He'd go out the wood pile and uh, lay a harmful on his arm, 
come walking in and he shook so three, four sticks dropped off before he ever got into the wood box. He could do more than eat but a bread too. And he even up in the new land, he used to light a match and burn the brush piles when my uncle warned him not to make any fire. It was everything too dry, didn't want the fire to get away from him. Mm-hmm. And next thing, and they were up on the day that you destroy weeds. He went up especially for that. Oh. And the uh, Octune stove. <laughs> When's that? <laughs> <laughs> it comes in July. And, no, August, in August, the abundance day. But I don't know how it is. My, my aunt claimed that she read someplace it's got to be done when the, the uh, signs are in the line. Oh. Uh, when it comes in the sign of the line. I don't oh, know. I, never, I do know my dad, he got rid of white briars over Dallas Town Cemetery, where my parents were buried, half of the lot was full of these white spin briars. Mm-hmm. Pop used to mow them off with the size. Every year, hey, up again. Yeah. So I knew one year I was only a kid. Went along up with him and took his lawnmower and the size on his back and come in there on the cemetery on the lot. And some old Oh, the old woman was down, oh, maybe 75, 80 feet down in the cemetery. And she let that come at this size. So she come up and she said, Mr., what do you want with that size? <laughs> he said, don't wonder what I want with the size. You see them briars? She says, I can't get rid of them. She said, don't you touch them today. You let them briars grow today. Don't touch them. And it was about two weeks after that, and she told him the day that he's to come up. And he said, she says, you come up with your side and you mourn, you won't have to mourn no more after that. Well, Dad says, I often heard that there was a day like that, but he didn't know where it was. And he never even marked it down. So that day come, he went up, he mowed him down. Next year, he took a little more in the size again, expecting well, the white briars, <laughs> spin briars. Come up there, wasn't any there no more. No. None there ever since. Hmm. Then he said, now what day was I up here? <laughs> he didn't even know the day he was up. Hmm. <laughs> well, well then, something. Uh, after Grammy stopped that fire, and I seen them stop blood time and time again. Grammy was the shoemaker. She'd repair everybody's shoes. Mm-hmm. One day she was sitting there in the, in the front porch repairing, uh, I guess, one of my uncle's shoes, and she had the shoe in her hand and had a, a regular shoe knife curved like that, mm-hmm. trimming the sole off, and it slipped off, and, and boy, tire. I cut this arc in. And boy, the blood just blew. My uncle Charlie, he happened just to be up uh, in the stone part of the house. Where they slept. He just had got married about maybe two years before that. He got married. He was 38 and his wife was only 18. Mm-hmm. She was from Pittsburgh. Oh. And uh, boy, when my granny cut herself, Aunt Maisie hollered, Charlie, Charlie, come down here. Mom cut herself. And boy, he come down and stepped straight next to me. And it's one of them steps that comes down and it makes a curve and comes out on the side. Narrow step here in the, mm-hmm. in, and over here it's wider than. Boy, he come running out there and boy, he just laid his hand on her and the blood stopped. Just like that, huh? Yeah. Well, I thought that was nice that you could do that. But it didn't interest me until that fire. That should change me. So, I laid, I know where Grammy kept this book. She had a, a cupboard sitting up in the corner, and it had little, not big glasses like that, uh, about uh, six by eight glasses in, in the doors. And you could see that sitting up in, in here, year round. But after I got interested, 
Then I wanted to know what she's done in him. I knew that she got it out of this book. Mm -hmm. So one day, I watched my chance. One day my Grammy went out and I thought, oh, she'll be out of all. And dumb as I was, I took it out of the cupboard and started in leafing through it, paging through it. And anyway, she happened to come in the door and she looked around. I sat back at the door on the couch. She looked around and said, see, now I had that book. That quick, she grabbed it and boy, I got a good tongue lash. Mm. <laughs> I was just going to show you where forget the page number. Oh, here's the one uh, that happens to be given to Carol. Well, there seems to be so much to learn. I don't see how you, you picked it up so easily. So many different prayers. If I'd have to study it now and learn these things by heart, uh, it takes me a long time to learn something, but once I got it in my head, I got it. But you've done it so often now, I guess oh, you know yeah. it all very well. Well, uh, and most, uh, I say half of what I do is uh, in Dutch. Mm -hmm. Did you speak any Dutch besides powwowing? Did you do any speaking of Pennsylvania Dutch? Oh, uh, when I started going to school, I, I couldn't say yes or no. Oh. Well, I was uh, raised Pennsylvania Dutch. And oh. my teacher was from Delta. She couldn't even understand one word. First thing I had that morning I started to tell the teacher about uh, all the, the horses and the cows and the chickens and the hogs and everything in Dutch. She didn't know one word and the kids in Holland <laughs> Half of the kids in you could talk as good as I Dutch, but they could talk English too. <laughs> Did you grow up down in Yale? You? Well, in other words, uh, the next time I got my hand, it, I didn't get it for a couple months. Finally, she had it there again. Well, I watched her. And yeah. The next time uh, I got my hands on it, it was Grammy. If you catch me this time before I'm done, it's my fault. I went up and I locked the balcony porch door and the and the door that come in from the stairway and the frame house. Mm -hmm. See, my uncle spilled the frame house up against the old stone house. Oh. And I locked myself in. She wasn't going to catch you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't c catch me that time. Oh. The first thing then I found when I hunted for that was, was that. Mm -hmm. a, a certain remedy to stop bleeding. And that's, a, that's an easy one. Well, the one my grandfather used to say when I had nosebleeds, I think it started out, Harry Christus Christus or still. Jesus Christus, Star is oh, blue. that's all I remember. Well, well now, this here is in <laughs> English. That's uh -huh. the same one. Jesus Christus, Star is blue. Da stoppen die Schmerzen, da stoppen das Blut. It'll stop the pain and the blood. And then I didn't get a chance, I, I wrote it in a notebook, and I didn't get a chance to use it till I, my dad was caretaker four years down at the York Water Company. Oh. And I come back home and the Susquehanna Trail, the state route got uh -huh. built. You know anything of that? Uh, not really, but I know which <laughs> one you're talking about. Well, <laughs> this road up here, the yeah. cement road. Uh -huh. Well, uh, my dad had a dog, he was a half breed. Called him Raleigh, his half bulldog and half hound. And he was a fighter. He'd get another dog who was a fighter and he had yeah. sloppy long ears. And my brother in law, Ed Stein, uh -huh. <laughs> he had a black dog called him Fido. And that dog, whenever he got out, where he uh, got into a fight somewhere. Uh -huh. And then my dog and Ed Stein's Fido, Fido, Met uh, down here at Butcher's Lane. I was out hunting. I had a little snow. And boy, they got to fighting, and Stein's dog slit his ear open, and Ooh. boy, did it bleed. Well, I didn't know it by heart, and I had it in a notebook at home in my good uh, suit. So I went home with the dog, and 
they track him all the way home in the snow. And uh, my dad had a hole out in the weather boarding that he could get in the barn back at the hay hole. That's where he slept. And he went out there, and I went in the house, and I said to my mom, I said, I want to go up and get my book. I said, Raleigh's ears split. He said, he's in the dog with a uh, fight with the dog. It's Dan Spider. Slit his ear. He says, I'm going to see if I can't stop his blood. She laughed. I mean, you can't stop the blood. Well, mom, I said, I how do I know if I don't try it? Mm -hmm. and I went up and up in my bedroom. I grabbed this notebook and, and I repeated that in uh, in English. That time I didn't know what the words was in, mm -hmm. in Dutch, but later on I found out what it was. Some old woman told me mm -hmm. what, how to say it in Dutch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there I, aren't too many people around anymore that speak Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> Well, it's a lot, but uh, a lot to uh, get off of it. I, yeah. I don't say that I can speak it quite as much. Uh, now with my wife here, she understands it, but she can't talk it herself. Mm -hmm. so I, I'm married the second time. Yeah, that's that's the one then that you yeah. I bet he had a book like this. I bet he did. Yeah. I Jesus, never saw it, but I bet he had Jesus it. Jesus Christ, the star of Splute. Jesus Christ, steers blood that stoppeth the pain and stoppeth the blood. Mm -hmm. And use the name mm -hmm. and say, in this help you, and call their name. Mm -hmm. Say it three times, third time, amen. Now, I thought that's what you were interested in. That's why I wrote yeah. some of this. Well, stuff. I am interested in it, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could ever do it, but I'm interested well, yeah, in it because yeah. it's... Yeah, it seems to be an important part no, of our history. Isn't. And I hate to see so many people, you know, laugh at it and say it doesn't work when there are so many cases where you can say, well, sure, it worked. It worked. Well, there's generally time. church, most of them are church people, too. Mm. Here it is. I bet you've never seen a piece like that. That you write on a dinner plate that you eat off of. You write it on with an indelible pencil on both sides, back and front. Put that in the fire. Oh. See what it is? S-A-T-O-R. 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 O-P-E-R-A. And then there. O-P-E-R-A. T-E-N. E T T E N E T. Oh, it goes all around and it, it comes right to the Let's middle. See if I can write that down. I want to remember that. So as we're at episode 100, I'd like to say we could not have made it without patrons. Thank you so much, patrons. There's no way we would have made it to 100 without you. It's your help that helps us make Strange Familiars. If I could thank every one of you, I would. I regret that we didn't, like other podcasts, start naming new patrons as they came in yeah, that every episode. Yeah, nice. <laughs> like The welcome, other thing with this is some people, like, some people don't want to be identified. Like, they don't want to be outed as being into the paranormal, so mm -hmm. I've always been very sensitive to that. When you hear guests on here, sometimes mm -hmm. it's not their real name, mm -hmm. and that's their choice, you know. So I never wanted to just kind of out people. That's mm -hmm. why I only give last initials a lot of times. But even that, you know, if somebody has a unique first name. It's too late for me, but everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> they might not want to be. So that's kind of the reason I, I didn't do it from the start. And then I think I'd have to ask each person individually, do you yeah. want to be named and so forth. So that's, you know, kind of one reason we don't name every single patron that comes in. But you have to know that you all have made a huge difference in our lives. Absolutely. And the only reason we're able to make this podcast is because of you. So thank you so much. Episode 100 is dedicated to you. Really, every episode is dedicated to you. But let's, you know, I'd like to especially dedicate episode 100 to the patrons because it's a wonderful thing that you allow us to do this. And with your help, we can continue to make strange familiars. If you'd like to help us, if you'd like to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. You can get extra shows there. You can get other stuff like t-shirts, stickers, and more. Go ahead and check it out. Patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. 
Like, subscribe, leave us good reviews wherever you're listening, whatever podcatcher you use, or on YouTube, wherever, and share the show on social media. If you don't like a subscription like Patreon, we have a one-time donation. You can see the paypal.me links at strangefamiliars.com in the show notes. Once again, thanks so much, patrons. What I don't understand, though, is why nobody does it anymore. It seemed to be so important for so long, and then it just sort of died well, away. Well, I tell you, you'd be surprised the people that come here. And I, if you take it, I had oh, quite a few women already come here. They had erysipelas in their face. Uh-huh. Their face looked pretty much another time as big as mm-hmm. uh, it should have. And their eyes were just swashed up, the little bit of light they could see through. And a lot of them, I try when they come up here, and three days after that, they come up, some overnight. That it makes disappears. a difference. I had one here a couple months ago. Her husband brought her here. I forget what her name was. And I tried for her. Three days later, she come back, and my wife told different people already. She said, that woman, her husband wouldn't be in with her. When she come back the three days later, she said she'd have never recognized her. She didn't. Yeah. She wouldn't have thought that she was that here. Was the same one. And it was the same one. And then my mother told me about a case of a, a little kid who poured a, a kerosene lamp down on him and was burned very badly. Okay. And that the doctor said he couldn't do anything for it. But my grandfather powwowed and no, the Paul, child Paul, lived. She is another one that uh, you get palsy. Oh. My wife, my first wife, she had it years ago. And some guy from, he out of Logan, Doc Smith had, that uh, had it. A year after, afterwards, this man still had his mouth all dropped to his side. Dr. Smith didn't help him a bit. Of course, my wife, she went to Dr. Smith, too. He thought he helped her. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had to go to a doctor? Me? Yeah. Well, I, I was with the doctor already for slight stuff, but I keep away all I can. I go to the chiropractor before I go to the doctor. Any way possible, I go to the chiropractors. Yeah, I, I go up to Perkins at uh, Wagenstein. Me and my wife. Mm-hmm. Boy, he helped us mm-hmm. wonderfully. Can you pow off for yourself, or doesn't yeah, that work? It don't work too good. You, you can. Uh, I, uh, oh, years ago, I uh, was taking a, a, a staple and I wrote this post to Can I get them out? Well, I gave them to you. Oh, these? Yeah. yeah. That's what I was looking to you. Okay. Uh, I was over here between the smokehouse and the gate was over in the chicken yard. There was a space there about that wide. And the wire come loose, stable come out of the old locust post. And I was standing over there and I, these little poker steeples. And them doggone locust posts are like that. <laughs> They're the mm-hmm. loud ones. Yeah. And I got a stable started and uh, held the wire so it don't pull my stable away and I took my claw hammer oh. and I, I hit a couple strokes and I, had, I didn't have it down, hold it down at the end of the handle and the handle hooked into a dog on wire oh. and threw my stroke up and I slammed myself right smack oh. on myself. Boy, I dropped the hammer and well, I was sitting there like that there right away and tried for it. And my wife happened at the same time to come over here on the garden side and she seen me stand like that. She says, what's the matter? Did you hurt yourself? Well, I couldn't answer her. I was trying for this. Yeah. <laughs> she got mad at me. I didn't say anything. I was gone. I said, yeah. I says, I hit myself with a claw hammer. I said, I'll lose that thumbnail. By God, it didn't even get black and blue. It didn't? Uh, it didn't affect it. And uh, many a time I knew I lost nails. Uh, fingernail or a thumbnail that just bruised a little bit and yeah. I never never gave it a thought that I'd done anything. Hmm. Yet don't want nail come on. And there I gave it a hundred or something. And I don't know, did I write that? No, for bruise. Yeah, for bruise. Here it is, for bruise or shingles. Yeah, for bruise, well, that's the one I I use. And hmm. I, I use that a lot. To, and that's also for shingles now. Somebody has the shingles all you see yeah. instead of bruise, you say shingles. And say that three times and then amen. 
Just when they have their shingles. Yeah, just yeah, that's painful. No, no rub no rub and repeat that. And then when you when you say in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, just make the process. But uh, I found also found out that if by name I cured people from uh, Hanover. Never never, never were there. down. I know uh, my yeah. My grandfather used, used to do just that. Just used too. their name. By not you know, they weren't necessarily there in no. the room with him, but he could do it. Yeah. yeah. That really amazed me when my mother told me that. I didn't know that you know you could do that, but she said if we were sick, well, she would I just tell them. Through dumbness that I picked that mm -hmm. up. Now for taking off, if you know the person's name for taking off, you can try it for them without even them knowing. Yeah. yeah, I thought you wanted to learn some of it. That's why I wrote some yeah, of it. Yeah, well, off. I'm interested in it. I, you know, I don't know if I could actually do it or not. I don't know if it would work. But don't it's... think that way. Think positive. Think positive. Think, well, I'm going to try and see if it works for me. But don't try. I know it won't work. Yeah, that's true. That's where you, where a lot of people lose out already. They don't believe it. They won't try it. Do most of the people that come to you, are they older people? Or I some... got all kinds. Young ones, old ones. I get people uh, uh, down uh, here to Maryland Nine. Uh, Official people. There, about a year ago, uh, she's married to, was married to a miller. She's only lived with her husband. They're separated. And her nose was bleeding. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock in the morning, day, I got a phone call. I said, okay, I says, all I need is your name. I says, I'll try it for you. Try it for them, and right away they loaded her in the car and they got her over here to uh, New Freedom mm -hmm. Road. Out on the state road, and when they pulled up to pull out the state road, no, it didn't Stop. lead no more. They turned around and went back home. <laughs> That's something. You must be very good at it. Does it seem like you're better at it now than you used to be? Or well, I don't say I'm better at it. I just do more of it. Do more of it? Does it? Yeah, I just do more of it. It's really something. I've heard some people talk about where they do things like with an egg and they put it in the fire. Stomach fever. Oh, do you do that? Yeah, but boy, I didn't have nobody with stomach fever, I'll say, for the last 10 years. Huh. I don't know for what reason, whether the doctors have something now that they give them that they don't get it. Or, but boy, I used to have bad ones. And I used to have my kitchen stove here. I'd... Uh, People would measure themselves. A lot of people know how to measure themselves. Take a cord string that would be wet or dirty or not so. And put it around your bare skin here where the ends come together at your navel. Cut mm -hmm. it off. And then uh, if you measure yourself three times, then you're supposed to keep every string separate. I always took a piece of paper and just put a notch in it. Put it in there and mark the paper number one, number two, and number three. They get a hen's egg, and uh, many a time I got people that I tried for in my kitchen still here at Coal Fire in. And uh, I wrap that string around that egg, set my prayer, put it in on top of a red hot coal fire. And if they have it hard, that string won't even scorch. And I had them in there that they were laying in there every bit of five minutes. But boy, when that cracked. It cracked like somebody had shot a, mm. a small little gunnel. And the ashes, the lids jumped and the ashes out of one on the floor. And then you want to hurry and get it out of the fire because then it will burn. Mm -hmm. I generally have my poker ready. And usually when they crack like that, the whole end busts up. And all you got is to string around the shell. I hook them on and get them out. I know years, oh, that's 40 years ago at least. Uh, Mr. Genstrom, Irving Genstrom, he had uh, four boys, and the youngest, Charles, he was sick for weeks, and Mrs. Decker, she was from Louisville, that was oh, his, yeah. uh, his uh, mother-in-law, I forget what her first name is, but she Dora. was, huh? It was it Dora? Yeah, I kind of believe it. Oh, yeah. She was, uh, she lived in, uh, 
up in a cottage, and so did Gensler. She lived across the street. I don't know what her husband's name was, but she was from Louisville, Decker. Sometimes I believe he used to call a door. There was a door at Decker, but I don't know if that's the right one or not. Well, uh, she's dead now a good many years. Yeah, her been wife been. is dead a good many years already. Well, she was after her daughter to have him tried for. He's got stomach fever. And, of course, Spencer himself, he didn't believe in it. He used to argue with me in there at the shop. So, I don't know, one morning I had a dream that my boss came running to me. He hurt himself and he was bleeding. He says, Phil, stop my blood, stop my blood. Dreamt, I said to him, Walt, I know you I try for you. You don't believe in it. And he was a Sunday school teacher. Well, I woke up here, it was a dream. Well, I forgot all about it. I went into the shop, and boy, before I got uh, my car ringing at the clock here, Merv Gensler walks up to me. He says, what are you going to do this dinner? Oh, I said, same as always. That time we had an hour off for dinner. I said, same as always. This is, I uh, eat my dinner and hang around here. I says, he says, I thought maybe you'd come over at the house. And he started telling me that... Uh, his boy Charles is sick for weeks already, and he says he's just at the point now that my wife from I don't get no sleep. We gotta walk the floor all night with him, and he keeps us both awake. He says I'm willing to try anything. I says, Where well, you don't believe in it? Well, he says, Well, and gosh, said long already, having tried for him stomach. And Uncle Charlie was standing close by and heard this, and uh, uh, telling me that uh, Charles is so sick. Mm -hmm. Uncle Charlie knew right away that he had uh, taken off. When they have stomach fever that hard, they were bound to have taken off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uncle Charlie just turned around, and I seen him clasp his hands, and he just so slow kept walking away from us. I uh, uh huh. I knew Uncle Charlie too well. He tried for him for taking off. Well, I rang the car in, went up my machines. Uncle Charlie came over to me. He said, Say, he says, I tried for Charles. It's taken off. He says, You go over the center and measure him, and you try for the stomach fever, and I'll try for this taken off. Well, dinner time, I went over. And I measured him. I measured him three times. Then I asked him for a piece of paper to keep him in rotation as I measured him. Then Gensler says to me, he says, can't you try it for him here? He wanted to see this. Mm -hmm. I says, no, Merle. I says, you only got a hot plate here in the kitchen. I says, I need a stove, fire, wood, either wood or coal fire. I says, I got to use fire for this. And I says, it's an electric uh, hot plate wouldn't do no, wouldn't be the, mm -hmm. no good. I says, how about my furnace? Oh, I says, I don't know. I says, it's hard to say. I never tried my furnace. Let's go down and look. And down, put the door open. Why? Yeah. I says, that's nice of the trap oil. And I says, at my kitchen stove. I says, my kitchen stove. I got him to leave the lid off and come right down over on top of this heap. I says, yeah, I can try here. But I says, no, I want a needle and a, uh, an egg. So I sent one of the boys up and got a needle and uh, an egg. And I started him wrapping the <laughs> string around. When I got to the end of it, I just took the needle and pushed the end underneath my wrap so it wouldn't unravel. And Gensler was standing there and he was talking, asking questions. Well, I, I couldn't answer him then. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I was busy he trying. Was busy. He seemed that I wouldn't say anything. So after I was done, I pulled the door open, took his little coal shovel, laid the egg on, and I rolled right in on that red hot coal fire. And boy, I thought he's going to stick his head in there. Boy, he coming in. I says, Mer, get your nose away from there. I says, you never know how soon them things crack. I says, you don't want no red hot coal blown in your face or in your eye. So I pushed the door shut and was not tight. See, the furnace is about that thick. And I left it a little crack, you know, that it was open until I could hear you know, we were standing there about five minutes before that darn thing went off. And before it went off, when it went off, it boomed and went. And I was ready. <laughs> I took the poker and I hooked it in there. 
and I rolled it around on the, the shelf. I said, Mummer, which side was laying on the red hot coal fire? Well, he was stunned, he couldn't talk. <laughs> he just looked and looked. Well, I was in a hurry to get back to the shop, I up the steps, and just as I reached for the cellar door, nervous, he said, Phil, he says, what kept that string from burning off? I said, Merle, well, I can't explain that. I says, I know when it don't burn off, I says, that patient has got it hard. I says, if it scorches and partly burns, then they ain't got it so hard. But I says, if that don't even scorch, I says, they got it hard. You know, I forgot to tell him that uh, when he starts to eat, that he's to eat light stuff, start eating light stuff. And uh, next morning he come in and boy was he too. He says, you know, Charles went to bed with us last night and he slept solid all night. He says, didn't wake us one time. And he says, this morning he got up and we got up and he says, you let us sit at the table and eat a hearty breakfast. Oh, I says, I should have told you not to let him eat any of you. Solid stuff, but it's too rough stuff. Eat light stuff for, to start out with. Never hurt him though. It's okay. Huh? And I come home and I tried to, for two days after that till I had the three strings used up. Mm-hmm. And he come along all right. World War II come along and he went through with flying cars. Mm. He was in the service. I know my mother said that my grandfather used to say that he was being punished if he did powwowing sometimes. He felt sick like he was being punished. Oh, well, uh, sometimes you feel pretty rotten. Yeah, I know. Why is that? But I, it takes strength out of you. You know, we read in the Bible where somebody touched Jesus' hem of his garment and he turned it around and asked who touched him. He felt the power going out of him. Uh-huh. They claim if our eyes would just be created a slight different than what they are, when we talk, you'd see flames of fire coming out of our mouth, comes from within. Kind of scary stuff, man, isn't it? <laughs> man is more powerful than he, if he knew how powerful he is. I don't know. I guess we're too unbelievable. Oh, I know. Well, I think there are a lot of people now who are starting to wonder about a lot of things, like, you know, being well, able to see things. Things are coming things. to more delight every yeah. day. Listen, I took a course from Earl Parker, Suggestive Passivity and Induction, and the first lesson I got, I knew right away that it was hypnosis. Yeah. You wouldn't call it hypnosis. It, it, he said it's actually Suggestive Passivity Induction. He says when you speak to somebody and keep repeating it. Mm-hmm. You may not believe it, but your subconscious is going to pick it up. Mm-hmm. And well, all he says is to his students is every night before you go to bed, you read your, these lessons once or twice for a whole week. By next week, you'll get another one. So I did that. Seventh lesson come along, and I, at that time, I smoked. I never smoked cigarettes. I smoked cigars and a pipe, and especially cigars, especially at the end of the week, Saturdays and Sundays. In the shop, I, well, I couldn't smoke and repair machines in the shop mm-hmm. after they did allow us to smoke in some parts of the shop. But, and I was chewing the back of them. And uh, the one thing that it didn't work all around on tobacco, the seventh lesson dealt on tobacco. And I didn't, I didn't think of one minute, I didn't give one thought that I wanted to quit smoking cigars. My dad was down in the county home once the first Sunday after the lesson come. I went down in the county home to see my dad in my coat pocket. I had as many cigars as I could stuff in there. Stuff full of them. Tight full. I come back home and here I had them all yet. Right. Didn't even dawn. Next Sunday I done the same thing. Still I it didn't dawn on me. I kept studying these lessons first by that time then I was on uh, number two and number three, seven, eight. I was on the ninth lesson after it dawned on me. So the third Sunday I went down there, my brother Adam 
He was there that time. And he just come to me. And I said, Adam. And I said, do you know what? I got myself under hypnosis. I says, I got these same cigars in here for the third week now. Oh, I don't believe you. He said, why are you walking around here with cigars in your pocket and don't smoke? I said, if they were in here, I pulled the whole handful out and handed it to him. I didn't smoke no more since then. And what kept me from putting chew in the back of it was a, a tooth. I had a rotten tooth. Uh, nerves sticking out, and if I forget myself and open my mouth and draw cold air in it or cold water, and boy, it almost put my feet out of my shoes. Yeah. And different times at night time, I must in my sleep open my mouth and draw yeah. cold air in there. Boy, oh, that waking me quick, and boy, oh, I grab my pants and get a pack of the bag out and put some tobacco in there. I wait, stop it. I say, yeah, if it wouldn't have been for that, I'd have even stopped you. But I, in a way, I'm glad I didn't cheat because Dr. Brown told me years ago, I seen him taking the back in his mouth when he come, when he go to your place or anybody's mm -hmm. place, some sickness, he'd take a little back in his mouth before he'd go in the door and spit it out there. I asked him one day, I says, Doc, I says, I don't think you're a chewer, but I says, I still see you take the back in your lap. He says, you know why I do that? If you've got the bag in your mouth, you won't pick up. No disease turned through your mouth. That's so. I never heard that. Hmm. And another thing, anybody that chews tobacco ain't going to be bothered with worms in his intestines. Hmm. You just get enough of the bag of juice down in there that kills the worms. When I was a kid, I know I used to. Boy, I used to have worms up it that long. Hmm. And they'd come out and I had these... <laughs> Pants tied around the knees here. Knee niggers or what they call yeah, them. Yeah, niggers, I guess. And boy, them darn worms crawled out and rebutting my pants. <laughs> boy, it used to scare me. Sure. But after I started in the back, and that was the end of that. No more worms. Did you ever hear of Weber's tea? I heard of it, but I don't know that word. I know. My husband's father said they used to have to take that when they were kids. That it was supposed to be good for all kinds of sicknesses. Uh, what my mother used to do is take bone set. Every spring and every fall, she'd make a milk crop full of bone set tea and set it out in the pantry in the pool. And every morning we'd get up, we'd take a cup and we'd push the green such scum like on top on the side and get about a half a cup of bones in. What was in that? Well, that's to purify your blood. And it, grandma, grandma used to say, uh, don't drink too much because it's hard in the marrow of your bone. What, was bone, it made with bones, bones or what? How'd they make it? They just make a tea like any other tea. Mm. Just take a handful and put it in the kettle. Make it hot. Boiling water or pour boiling water on it. And then... Well, that was years ago. My dad had a large sliver, and he was doctoring and doctoring and nothing helped him. The doctor couldn't give him anything to help him. So one day, J.D. Stump, John Stump, that was my dad's first cousin. He was a, he was a wonderful good father of our doctor. He come walking up the other side of the street and talked across the street. He says, Frank, he says, what seems to be your trouble? Well, he says, Tommy Ross, the doctor says I got an enlarged sliver. <laughs> he says, you can soon get rid of that. He said, well, how? He says, get yourself some yara tea and drink that. He says, you soon won't know you had an enlarged liver. And my mother was standing inside the screen door listening to the conversation. And mother said, if John would have turned around and looked back on him there in Charles Street in the bank, now there's houses built there. But at that time it was open lots. Mother said it was full of it. Uh, uh, Shufri is the Dutch name and Yara is the English name. Oh. It looks a little like the wild cars, you know what wild cars look like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, the flower is a flat top, uh, flat top flower, same as wild cars, mm -hmm. only the blossoms are little clusters like, but it's a flat top and a white flower gets oh. on. And they don't get quite as high as the other. And the, uh, Leaves are more like a fern, oh. and 
you pull some of them leaves off and use. Mmm, boy, you can tell. It don't smell like carrots. It's got an awful strong smell. Well, my mother went over and got some, made some tea for him, and she had tea ready. She took half a cup out and handed it to my dad. My dad said, What do you got now? Just what Stump told you. He took it and drank it. <laughs> he told us, Boy, if you think for one cent is up in the tea, he said, You take some That's money out of huh? tea. Mm. And you know, in a short time, this enlarged liver was gone. Hmm. And I read in. Uh, Prevention that it, it's good for quite a few other things too. Yeah, I think there are more people now who are starting to be interested in some of the cures that people used to use because. Well, now that our work plant, that's a wonderful good thing. If you burn yourself or a bee stings you, and you take put a leaf off of there and squeeze that watery juice out, oh. it's a thick, heavy juice, in. and also it's good for your hair. Oh. Yeah, I had a. Sore spots on my head, and I started in putting that on, it healed it all. Hmm. That's a vital plant. That's older than, well, a uh, thousand years before BC, it was people used. Yeah. That's a vital plant. Yeah, it sure is. A, it's just a shame that there aren't more people. That are really oh, interested in surprise myself. I had a woman from Dallas Town. I worked food reflexology too. Oh. Work on their feet and even on your hands. And a uh, woman from Dallas Town, Mrs. Fig, about two years ago, the two daughters brought her over, stuck down there at the barn, one door on one side and the other door on the other side, bringing her up the walk. And I thought, I'm going to see him going to get her up here. Got her up here and I tried for her nerves. And then I said, pull them shoes off. I says, I want to stop. He says, I want to work on her feet. And I started working her feet. And a couple of weeks she come, come over here and jumped out of the car and she come up the walk here like I do. And then sitting on the chair there, she went like this. She says, you know, I couldn't do that for years and years. I couldn't get my foot up like that. I couldn't believe it. Well, her son Ricky brought her over that time. He says, that's right. He says, Mom couldn't do that. Hmm. She could do it. And boy, you want to see how she got along. And uh, she was one woman that, I guess, the kids let her. She sold the corner of the walls and died. Hmm. And I think the, the kids got the down that she didn't got any money anymore. Yeah. And she was coming over here. I didn't get none, Mom. I was just too glad if I could help her. Yeah. So she's got a daughter that's got a tap room anywhere. Yeah. And uh, when she got to see her, she asked her what doctor she's going to. She said, I ain't going to no doctor. I'm going over to Jacobus Smitty and have a try for me and work on my feet. She says, you pay the man. She said, I ain't got no money to give him. Next time she come here, by God, she put a $10 bill down there. Did you get that ten dollar bill? And that's where she got it. Her daughter. Her daughter. Yeah, her daughter gave it to her. No, I'll try for anybody. I don't care if they pay me or not. I just, you know, it doesn't seem possible that there were so many people around that powwowed, and now there's just there used to be a lot of. There used to be so many. It's a shame. Especially in this area, in York yeah, County. Yeah, Harry Alpenbach's going, uh, and uh, Jenny Ritz, and uh, Mrs. Frank's in New Freedom. She died at Rohrbach's uh, convalescent. I got a convalescent home. And Emick in New York, she's going. This is some old lady. Used to be a little girl hard up at. Uh, Thomas Will. Oh. Mrs. Fair. Mrs. Fair is the one that learned me how to try for uh, shingles. Oh. Is she from this area? No, she uh, up above Spring Grove. Oh, but Spring Grove. Yeah, up above Spring Grove. Emma Fair. Okay. Uh, her and her husband both are dead now. Hmm. Well, I took my first wife up. Uh, Somebody out of the family, uh, it'll 
help better than if you try yourself in my book, particular over there. And and Mrs. Fair found out that I'm trying for people too. And then she told me, she says, I wish you should be up here with and uh, see if it's all right. He had a sore leg for years. He worked in a stone quarry and a stone rolled up against his leg and bruised him. And he had trouble ever since then. And she says, I was trying to him for over a year and I can't I can't do nothing with him. And he says, I wish you'd be up here when uh, he comes. So she finally made an arrangement that he comes the time we come up there. And boy, he come that night there and he was such an awful hard of hearing. He pulled his pants leg up and pulled his stocking down. Oh, his leg was like when there's a crow. I thought, oh man, you've got a good start of gangrene in that leg. I didn't say nothing, but I tried for him. Next week he was up again and I tried for him again. You know, in three weeks' time that thing healed up. And then, uh, oh, a couple of months later, here he hunted me up and come back on him again. And uh, then I tried for him again. And after I was done trying, his wife was sitting over there and I rough at her. And she just talked a little old see but he didn't know he could not. You had to talk real loud to him. He says, I want to ask you something, she says. You know, she was juice to back. And she says, he never spits the juice away. He says, Swallows all that juice. Oh, I said, no darn wonder. I said, that's the that's weakest spot in his body. I said, that's the only And no wonder that breaks out. So, I tried for him again. He come down three times. And it healed up. And uh, a month or so after that, he was out. He had a big tractor and a saw on it, strong cordwood. And his house is a long side of a hillside. And here he was sewing wood, and the wood fell down in front of the wheel, between the front and the back wheel. And instead of moving the wood away, he crawled on the tractor and wanted to pull away. And when he pulled away and the tractor ran up on the pile of wood, it rolled over and the tractor rolled on him and killed him. Well, if you don't mind, I'll take these along. Yeah, okay. I'll do them all for you. Okay, that was very kind of you. I thought you wanted to learn to try. I'm going to take these. Try it. Yeah, I'm going to try It's not going to hurt to try, right? No, you can't hurt none. It's like the Dutchman says, one snick spot shot snicks. What's that? If it don't do no good, it won't hurt you. <laughs> That's right. Doctor gives you medicine, it might not do you no good, but it'll hurt you. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it'll hurt you. And it might be good that nobody gives it to you and it just sets something else off on you. That's one thing this won't do. Well, we got all the way through the episode before I realized we actually didn't introduce Allison's mom as anyone other than Allison's mom. So I want to thank Catherine Deal, who is Allison's mom, for doing the interview with Philip Smith, for allowing us to use the interview, and for coming on the show and talking to us about both her remembrances of Pow Wow and the interview she did in the 1970s. Thank you, Catherine Deal, for being part of the show. You heard me editing yeah, mm-hmm. the Philip Smith interview, and that's the first time you've heard it probably since those Stone Breath records when, when we listened to it. I think when we first, we might not have even put it onto CD at the time. No, no, I didn't. I, think I, just, just, I just took to clips out of the tape. We just listened to it. Just it on cassette. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just copied little clips out. Uh-huh. What was your impression? Well, first, the fact that I thought he was so old at the time, and now he doesn't seem old at all, because he's only in his 70s, so it was like... <laughs> It, he reminds me of my elderly neighbors I grew up next to. Yeah. yeah very much. I, it's like that general, even just the way he talks is like kind of like what the older people I remember talk like and people don't talk like that anymore. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. He, he's, you know, he's talking about World War One. He's talking about people going to World War One and then going to World War Two. He lived through all that, you know, uh-huh. and then it's just amazing to hear someone talk about that. And he died, I think, in 1984. 
Yeah, he must have been born, what, in the early... I think he was born in... 03 or 04, something like yes, that. Yes, like 1904 or something. So... An amazing time historically to live. Yeah. This is not the last powwow show we'll be doing, nor the last time we'll be hearing your mom interview people about powwow. She was very thorough. <laughs> we have more tapes of her interviewing local elderly people about powwow and their experiences with mm-hmm. powwow and so forth. So we will put together more powwow shows in the future. We'll be able to play those tapes and we'll have other guests as well for other perspectives of oh. powwow. Maybe get some modern powwowers on as well. Episode 100, it's in the books. Thanks to everybody for listening. I want to thank Theo K for a PayPal donation. Very generous. Thank you so much. And of course, once again, thanks to the patrons. Thanks everybody for listening. Will there be a related patron episode? For... There will. See, what happened is I got sick with <laughs> this Fay flu from Joshua. <laughs> and from fate, not from Joshua. No, it's from Joshua. <laughs> I have to lay a certain amount of guilt on the Josh, <laughs> which will buy me more time to work on the Bigfoot oh, okay. book, you see. Yeah. The more guilty he feels, the less pressure he will put on me uh-huh. about finishing the book. And th- there's a method to my madness. Uh-huh. So, yes, this isn't entirely because of Josh. It's <laughs> totally his fault. So I had recorded an hour and a half, I think, uh, close to it. Over an hour anyway, with Josh and Soraya. Just kind of a, a laid back talk about Strange Familiars, about kind of celebrating the 100th episode podcasting i was going to edit that and put it just tag it on the end of this episode uh-huh. that's not going to happen i just don't feel i don't good. think it really belongs there anyway i think it's a separate entity we will release that for patrons oh yeah and as you heard throughout the episode a lot of other podcasts kind of sent us congratulations for this uh-huh. so thanks to all of them we'll put links to all of them in the show notes in case you didn't catch yeah that's a fun part of doing the podcast being part of a community and sort of learning from other people and yeah it's awesome and uh thanks everybody for doing that this other podcast is really neat i wanted to kind of bring more people into the 100th episode celebration that kind of helped do that so yeah thanks for doing that all right everybody thanks for listening we will see you next week as long as things don't turn for the worse with the fey flu (laughs) and the sun's gone down so we probably will have our celebratory fireworks within minutes (laughs) uh at some point i'm going to take a vacation at some point, there's going to not be a weekly episode this summer of Strange Familiars. But, uh, oh, are we going somewhere? I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. We don't really have any money, but we could go camp somewhere. Or... or just not do a podcast for a week. Yeah, just take a break. <laughs> but uh, I believe next week we will have a new episode. So see everybody next week. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more darkhollerarts.com Intro and background music is by Stonebreath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. You can find us on Facebook facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. You can join the Strange Familiars gathering group there as well. You can also find us on Instagram at strangefamiliars. Whoever carries this book with him is safe from all enemies, visible or invisible. And whoever has this book with him cannot die without the holy corpse of Jesus Christ, nor drown in any water, nor burn up in any fire, nor can any unjust sentence be passed upon him. So help me. Second.